Hello everyone, Karnasa here, and welcome back to Kerbal Gets Real! And we have now hit that all-important year. The year is 1957, the year Sputnik 1 made it to space. And trust me, we have many historical things for our space agency this episode. We are going to attempt to shoot for the moon. Now, once again, we're going to start in the Vehicle Assembly Building, because before we go for those lunar antics, though, we have some, well, different rockets to build. Because that Artemis 1, which is going to be launched on the Hercules 2, Heracles 2 launch vehicle, I might say, we will build that in about 100 days. But the 350-ton launch pad that we are going to need to launch that thing is going to take 200 days. So that would be around 100 days of just having a rocket in storage doing absolutely nothing. So we picked up the first weather satellite contract and we are going to build this thing I have dubbed Storm 1. And yeah, this will complete that contract. It's got a thermometer and a barometer on it purely for aesthetical reasons because we don't need that. We have completed all of the science that those can get us in low Earth orbit, which is where all this is going to go. However, now we move on to the next thing that we are going to be building in the Vehicle Assembly Building at the start of this episode. And this is going to be the next iteration of the Aperture Rocket series. That's right, we are going to once again send a camera up into space and return it successfully. We were, well, we were rather good at returning things last episode. We had three launches and none of them failed, so hopefully we can do the same with one of these and get a lot more science on the way. This camera is capable of earning up to 200 science, although only 50 science at a time, so we are going to have to do this in multiple launches. And the way I'm going to return that valuable scientific data is that sample capsule up at the top. Returning that camera in one piece is rather difficult because of its shape. It is long and cylindrical and putting a heat shield on that doesn't really cover it particularly well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep the camera up in space. It's going to take all of the pretty photographs and it is going to move them over to that capsule at the top. Then. We decouple that capsule, then the capsule is the thing that returns to Earth, and that thing, ah, let me tell you, it is a lot easier to get that back safely on the ground rather than that rather ridiculously large camera that we have got. And hopefully, with this, we should be able to get, well, yes, a rather large amount of science over a couple of years, because, well, that's how long this thing takes. Two years. So, this is going to definitely be a long-term project that we will be be doing. But here we have the launch of Storm 1 on a Hercules small launch vehicle. It's the 2nd of March 1957 and this is the first launch of this series that I have done at night and there is a reason that we are launching this rocket at night and that is this thing for the rest of this career, well hopefully for the rest of this career, it's going to be my transfer window planner. So the reason why I've launched this at night is because I wanted to launch it into the plane of the moon. And that is, well, that just it just coincided that this was at night. And now, what I like to do, this is my way of figuring out transfer windows. We get something in an orbit around the plane of the moon, and then we use Mechjeb, Maneuver Planner, and the Advanced Transfer to Another Planet function within that, and we can select our planets we can create a node, it'll tell us exactly how long it's going to take to get the optimal transfer. And it will also tell us the delta V. So what we can do is that we can then put those values into Kerbal Alarm Clock and it gives us a nice little reminder of when we can actually do those. And it'll also tell me, you know, the delta V. So I can then go into the Vehicle Assembly Building, I can check up on it, and I can build a rocket around that information. So. That's just, that's personally just the way I like doing it. I think I have seen on Reddit a lot of people kind of do it that way as well. But here we have Aperture 2 is being completed and it has been rolled out. So we are going to send up our camera. Aperture 2 on a Hercules Small once again on the 17th of May 1957. Now, we've seen a lot of Hercules Small launches. So I'm going to cut out the launch and get to the actual well, orbital maneuvering. There's not going to be an awful, awful lot of orbital maneuvering, but because I've only got one solar panel on this thing, I need to make sure that that thing is correctly aligned with the sun. Otherwise, this thing will run out of battery very, very, very quickly indeed. That camera does take an awful lot of electric charge to run. 
Now I didn't put enough avionics on that complete upper stage to actually use, well, to control it. So what I had to do was I had to keep the core stage on it whilst maneuvering this, which, well, it was a little bit tricky to do, but I managed to get the exposure to 97%, which I was rather happy with. As soon as we'd done that, yep, we jettisoned that core stage and left this camera up in orbit, where it will spend probably a little bit longer than the next two years. Well, no, no, it will probably spend around half a year in orbit. But now, we're back at the Space Center once again. And what we're gonna do, well, we just need to wait for that launch pad to be finished now, and then we can launch those Heracles 2 series of rockets. Finally, we can really go for the moon. But first, I wanna head into mission control because there is something that I want to try. And it is, of course, to pick up the first orbital flight. It is a risky move, but I think we can do it. We're given three years to achieve that contract, and we are given a lot of money, around 900,000, which put us over a million. So we're gonna spend all of that money and upgrade our research and development, upgrade our vehicle assembly building so we can really start churning out those rockets. Here we have Hercules II, the first launch of this rocket series. This is our attempt at shooting for the moon. This is Artemis I, and well, yes, we have on that booster stage, we have four LR-89 engines, and then the core stage has two LR-105 engines. There are a lot of components with this rocket. That means there is a lot of chance of failure because, well, yes, we have this core stage, and then we go up to the upper stage, which is another LR-105. It still only has around about a 3% ignition failure, which isn't all that bad. The worst thing about this rocket is obviously that AJ-1042 upper stage, which is horribly, horribly bad and horribly unreliable. No, I still think we're floating around a 13, 14% ignition failure chance, which is really, well, quite unfavorable and quite high, and we would rather be using more reliable engines, but we're only in 1957, so we will have to make do with what we've got. Here I am going into the map screen and doing that all important maneuver. And the way I like to do this is create a maneuver node, drag that prograde vector out until it roughly hits in, well, it intersects the line of the moon and then wiggle it around <laughs> around Earth a little bit until we get an encounter and then use maneuver node editor to fine tune it. I did cut out a lot of the fine tuning there because it took me a really, really long time to even get this orbit, which doesn't even hit the moon. It doesn't hit the moon like we so want it to do. So we are going to have to make a few course adjustments along the way, because Mechjeb messed up. Mechjeb messed up when I did my ascent guidance, and I don't know why. It got me an inclination of 1.22. Usually it is pretty spot on with doing those launches, but for some reason it decided, nope, not today, I'm going to go in a completely different direction and kind of mess up the last little bit of the ascent, which, yeah, meant that my inclination was, well, only 1.22 degrees off, but still that is enough to prevent us from getting a really, well, from impacting. So, yeah, there's the periaps on the moon, and that is quite clearly not going to hit, which was a bit annoying. So what I had to go and do is I had to check and see how much Delta V I had left in my RCS. And I had 19 meters per second left. That's not an awful lot. So with a little bit of magic with the maneuver node editor, I did actually manage to get us on an impact course with the moon using only about 12 meters per second of Delta V. And of course we have that much. We have that much in the RCS. RCS has been my savior for this mission. Now, I do really like using RCS to do all this kind of stuff. It is a phenomenal tool in real solar system. I know we don't really use it all that much in stock KSP. I can't really remember actually. It's been so long since I played stock KSP that I can't remember how much I used RCS in it at all. But I know obviously reaction wheels and that are really overpowered and yeah, so you, I think you don't use it a lot, but man, in Realism Overhaul, RCS is really your ally. It is so good at really fine-tuning orbits, especially when you want to go for things like geostationary orbits. Having just a few little 
adjustments using the RCS on a rocket is just invaluable and it yeah I, I, I honestly swear by it and I would advise you to kind of open your eyes to the magic of RCS I don't I really don't know what I'm going on about here but it is it's fantastic but there you can see we have got that impact encounter with the moon we are going to go screaming into the lunar surface and leave a rather small crater i imagine this thing doesn't weigh an awful lot i had to take off as much as i could to well actually get the delta v to get here but here is the last few minutes of artemis one's flight before it crashes onto the lunar surface Well, Artemis 1 was a resounding success, and we got a lot of science, which of course we are going to spend straight away. We are going to unlock a few more bits, and here came a bit that hurt. Taking away 500,000 funds. Obviously, my research and development is fully upgraded, and in order to unlock basic capsules, you need to upgrade that research and development building once. And I have said I did not intend for my research and development building to be completely upgraded from the start, so... What I was going to do was going to take away funds when I needed to upgrade it. And I know from playing RP1 before, an RP1 career before, that it is 25 science points is the limit of the first R&D building. And I believe it is 500,000 to upgrade it. If anyone knows any different, if I've got that wrong, please feel free to correct me in the comments. And of course, I will adjust it in my game as and when I can, because... Yeah, if, if it's more than that, I'm happy to pay more. If it's less than that, brilliant, I get more money back. But here we go, rolling out Artemis 2 onto the launch pad for the second launch of the Artemis series. On the 18th of October, 1957, and you may have noticed there that yes, we had a engine failure on the launch pad. But that's okay, because we can just do what I spoke about last episode and kind of cheese our way through that. And yeah, everything else well, everything else for the launch vehicle worked successfully. We have been incredibly fortunate with failures these past two episodes. Up until now, we have not had any failures at all last episode or this episode so far. And we have been using those AJ-10-42 engines quite a lot, which I've not had the best of luck with those in the past. I really haven't. I got to this stage in a space agency before, and I wasn't using the AJ-1042, I was using the one previous to that. And I failed, basically. I ran out of money because I put all of my funding into reaching the moon and the AJ-10 engine failed on me. And yeah, that was, that was rather upsetting. But no, we have not had a single one fail upon us. We have not had a single mid-burn failure as well, which has been really, really nice. Really really fortunate with those engines and if you saw then we actually managed to get the moon on the first try no rcs fiddly bits that we had to do later on except for when i decoupled that top stage but it was just a little little bit of rcs control to get it back and here we come once again crashing down onto the lunar surface for all of that wonderful wonderful science And of course, we are back into research and development because we can unlock basic capsules. And because we can do that, we can hire our first pilot, Albert Harper. You will be the first man in space because we are going to get you on that Mercury training as soon as we can because, well, it takes 260 days. So we really, really, really want to get started on that as soon as possible if we are going to hit the deadline. I mean... The deadline is three years. We picked that up this episode, this episode being 1957. We've got until 1960 to achieve first, first crewed orbit, which I think we are more than capable of being able to do. The rate we are going, we have unlocked the technology. We should be able to launch a Mercury capsule. That is what I've gone for. I obviously did the Mercury training. We should be able to launch a Mercury capsule, I think, on a Heracles 2. Because that thing, that can lift up to almost five tons. 
I can't remember off the top of my head how much those capsules weigh, but I think we should be able to do it. And, well, the G-forces the Heracles 2 pulls aren't actually that bad. 4.7 at absolute maximum. And here we have the last launch of 1957 Artemis 3 on the 19th of December. And yes, once again, we had an ignition failure on the launch pad, but uh, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And we're going to cut out most of the launch once again. Well, because it's night and we have seen now two of these launches. Now, yeah, we have been really lucky because once again, that AJ-1042 fired. All of our failures have been coming on the launch pad, which, as I mentioned last episode, is kind of, we can kind of mitigate those failures, and everything else has gone rather well. We have done our full burn there. It is registering that we are not going to hit the moon for some reason, but as soon as I detach this, do a little bit of adjustment using the RCS on that final stage. We do. We see that indeed we are going to be smashing directly into the moon for the third time this episode. It's going to be great. It's going to get us all of the science that we could possibly want. This episode has been very good for science. This episode has been very good for money as well. But there we go. Here we are fast approaching the moon and suddenly the sky goes black because of course the moon is blocking out the sun. But yeah. Impact. But that was it. That was the last launch of 1957. We find ourselves on the 24th of December after that little bit of space flight for that probe to actually impact the lunar surface. And what a great year it's been. We have earned a, well, a huge amount of money. We have earned a huge amount of science. We're going to go in and we're going to pick up 1960 orbital rocketry now for those all-important AJ-10 mid-series, which is going to be fantastic. An engine that we can ignite unlimited times. It's going to be great for our agency. It'll really power us to unlimited heights, I guess you could say. But yeah, 1958 is coming and boy, is it going to be a good year. We are really, really going to push for crude flight next year. It's been something I've been holding back on. Obviously, I didn't do X-Planes or anything, so my initial four have retired already. But it is nice. And of course, we're going to have to get them up safely. That Heracles 2 rocket is capable. 4.7 Gs it pulls, as I mentioned earlier, which is definitely, definitely not an astronomical amount of g-forces for our astronauts and they should be fairly capable of holding those g-forces when we launch them up. Jane Jones, the next girl on our roster. We have two astronauts in training and yes, they will be the first people in space, hopefully in 1958. But 1958 will be next year and next year will be in the next episode. If you have enjoyed this episode, why not go and give it a like? If you have really enjoyed this episode and would like to continue with the content on my channel, please do go and subscribe as well. I have been Karnasa, and I will see you later. <laughs>